Now, one of the panel of guests here has said the greatest evolutionary asset of the panda has been that it looks like a teddy. He's going to take some stick for that. Every day, up to 200 species go extinct. So why does the panda get so much uh, attention? Well, to discuss that, we have Simon Watt, evolutionary biologist and presenter of TV science programmes and author of that quote. Uh, Colin Butfield, the director of public engagement and campaigns for the WWF. And Jin Li, who is with the BBC's uh, Chinese service. And all of you, thank you very much indeed. Welcome. And I suspect we'll get more uh, kind of Twitter comment about this item than anything else. Okay, Simon, set it out there. What is the case against the poor panda? Well, I like pandas. Much as I slag them off and everything, they are a beautiful species, they are wonderful, but they are not the be-all and end-all. Whenever we see how much money is spent on them, I don't know if we are getting the most biology for our buck by putting our investment in conservation for that one species. Now, the good news is that we are using them as a kind of poster boy. Uh, whenever we protect the panda, we generally try and protect its habitat. And through doing that, we protect things like the red panda and other species that live in that same area of China. The bad news is, though, we're effectively having something amounting to the culture of celebrity in conservation. And if we have 200 or so species going extinct every single day, we just have to be a bit smarter with our money. We have to make sure we get the best for our investment in conservation. Colin Batfield, what's your response to that? Um, well, I agree with part of it, um, but you could just as interestingly say at the same quote that um, the crested ibis had the good evolutionary fortune to live in the same forest as the panda. I mean, one of the reasons why the panda is so successful as a conservation icon is because we've used it to protect huge areas, about 3 million hectares in China, that has a ton of other biodiversity and great benefits to the local population. And as a conservation organisation, that you know, we don't raise as much money as we'd like to to save everything in the world. You've got to find the best hooks you possibly can to conserve an area with the most biodiversity diversity in it and that area where the panda lives is certainly important for that and just worth mentioning that your logo is a panda a panda absolutely um, but even having conserved all that area are they producing in sufficient numbers we talked about how bad they are at reproduction they yeah. need, seem to need an awful lot of help well, to reproduce now isn't that evolution's way of saying you know what their time is up um, no, actually, it's a, it's a bit of a myth. I mean, it's absolutely true in captivity. Um, we could ask what species perform very well in, in, in captivity like that, but in the wild, they've existed for an awfully long period of time. The big threat to them is not really an evolutionary one. It's the fact their habitat's being destroyed, and in some small numbers of cases, they're getting caught in snares, but mostly habitat. OK, we're going to come back to this argument in a moment. I, you know, I just want to talk to you about the importance of the panda, not only to the Chinese economy, but also to sort of geopolitics and diplomacy because they, the pandas have played an enormous role. Yes, and also first I want to mention that it's also uh, closely as associated with Chinese culture and it fits in many ways into uh, the three dominant Chinese religions that is Buddhism, Taoism and Confucius beliefs uh, like the panda, he's a vegetarian. Uh, like a Buddhist monk and uh, he behaves well like a Confucius follower. And also it seems that he followed the Confucius practice, uh, the Taoist practice, uh, conquering the world by inaction. And the uh, panda diplomacy has been a long time, uh, since uh, I think 600 AD, that's when Eastern Roman Empire uh, at the same time of East Roman Empire. And in more recent times, you can see that the desire that it should be in a zoo in London or Washington has led to great efforts at rapprochement at times when maybe relations weren't that great between those countries, you know, at a Cold War period. Yeah, and also even the Chinese government now doesn't recognize uh, the panda diplomacy uh, because in 1982, I think it's under the uh, pressure of the WWF uh, that they officially announced that they have stopped panda diplomacy. Uh, before that, they sent, I think, 24 pandas to nine countries for better diplomat diplomatic relations. But afterwards, it's on commercial uh, leases in order to protect the species. Uh, Colin, do you think that there is a link between, I mean, it sounds a, f a kind of silly argument, but there is a link between the attractiveness of an animal, and let's face it, the panda is gorgeous, and the willingness of the public to support efforts to protect it. 
there's, there's definitely a bit of a link, certainly a link to grabbing attention. Um, but actually what you often find is that people then get attached to a place. I mean, an example being the Amazon. Um, people are very much more passionate to conserve the Amazon than necessarily a particular species within it. Um, but the fact it is an attractive animal definitely draws people in. The important thing is then you find the stories to tell as to why it is you're conserving the area, not just a particular species in a, 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 a little protected area or something. Uh, and I guess that your uh, kind of interest in this is that it's not just about the panda. Yeah. You are getting people who may be very urbanised from yep. around the world interested in what happens in our rural environment and what happens, you know, in places that are in habitats that are under threat. Exactly. And I mean, that's the big root of all of this. If you put it into context, we spend about one and a half million pounds a year globally um, donated towards WWF that goes <coughs> on panda conservation. There are bankers sitting not 500 metres from where I am that got that in a bonus last year. Um, it's a tiny percentage of a Hollywood movie. The fact is we're not raising nearly enough money for conservation. So we've got to find every tool we possibly can to inspire people. <coughs> I took a glass. <laughs> That's clearly <laughs> Simon, go and answer that. Um, well, OK, there's, there's something definitely to this. Um, and there is not enough money for conservation. That's a plain fact. I would also say that it's very likely that there will never be enough money for conservation. If there was a paper published last year by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature saying that it will take £50 billion annually to protect all the environments. We are nowhere near hitting that. Even our government's own pledges to meet by 2020, we'd have to increase our spending by an order of magnitude to try and have any discernible impact. So, knowing this, we have to be wise with what we do. And particularly whenever it comes to things like zoos. Um, so the panda is a great draw for zoos across the world. It is still is that not, a good or a bad thing? It is both a good and a bad thing, because even zoos are not the be all and end all. The outdoor world, the natural world, is more than just an outdoor zoo. And we have to think about all these other species. So there's things like the marsupial mole, which is <coughs> just as endangered, if not much more endangered than the panda, and there isn't a single one in a zoo in the entire world. So by focusing on this, by having a sort of celebrity culture, it can be to our detriment. It is good for getting attention, but I would rather that we educate ourselves and the public and the scientists and everybody involved to the plight of nature as a whole, rather than focusing and being myopic on a tiny little fraction of it. Colin, do you believe that? Do, do you accept that, that there is a celebrity culture in, um, in conservation? There's elements of it, but the key thing is the moment where it overlaps with a key biodiversity hotspot. So WWF, we mapped out the key most important areas in the world for biodiversity conservation because of the very thing that Simon quite rightly said, we're never going to get enough money to save it all. Um, but it so happens that the area where the panda lives is one of those areas. So using it as the poster boy to draw in efforts within China to protect it and money that can be donated to organisations like WWF to send to help make that happen is a vital way of doing it. Jean you seem to be making the point that, I mean, you know, kind of, I think the West takes this very patronising view that were it not for our love of pandas, the panda would be extinct now. What you're saying is that the Chinese people themselves, they want to preserve the panda, they want to preserve their habitats because it's such of, it, of its centrality in your culture. Yes, and, uh, but not historically because uh, the biggest threat to a panda is the growing Chinese population in Sichuan province. Uh, where a thousand years ago there were only maybe a couple of million people, but today it's 80 million people. So uh, in the history, uh, Chinese hunters also killed pandas for their meat and skin, and uh, they were all driven into deep mountains until the end of uh, uh, 19th century. It was discovered by a French missionary uh, who brought panda again back uh, to the civilized world. So now Chinese people realize the importance of it because it's uh, uh, China's, I should say, soft power, uh, which is associated with uh, harmony, friendship. I mean, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And that, that, and that still matters. That, that's still, and that is still an important consideration. Yes, exactly. Uh, both, especially from the perspective of government, uh, although it has officially announced uh, the stop of panda diplomacy, but still, it, you know, uh, when it gives commercial lease of panda to foreign countries, it's still a uh, gesture of friendship, for example, uh, whether to Japan or to Taipei or Hong Kong. It's quite an interesting argument. I mean, it, it, you know, we kind of talk of uh, things in simple evolutionary biology in the way that you would. And that there is, you know, if you're, if you're China, there is a big, wide, much wider consideration there uh, that is, m goes beyond the boundaries of, of your subject matter. Oh, yes, definitely. There's cultural things to all, all manner of creatures. Um, I think always of the way that uh, Margaret Atwood 
frequently phrases our, our love of nature is it's important that we love nature in order to save it. And so if you do have a cultural connection there, like we have it in Britain with things like <coughs> badgers, foxes in urban areas, you name it, we have our own creatures that we feel passionate about because of connections maybe forced in childhood. But if we see that as the be all and end all, we are going to miss so, so much. We're currently living through the greatest extinction since the time of the dinosaurs. That the level of the problem, the scale of the problem is astronomical. And if we think, if we get too self-congratulatory by focusing on a few things and a few successes, then we're, it's ultimately to our detriment. All of you, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating, fascinating discussion. In my own evolutionary development, I must learn to drink water and not send it down the wrong pipe, causing me to choke uh, live on air.